Okay, so welcome to our collaborate number three, I believe. I'll just press um, Camtasia, and I hope I will record it through Camtasia as well as through our normal system. So let's hope for the best. I invested my own money in that, so it better works. Um, so what I'm planning to do also is the following. We have this unit in our modules, and that's really cool. But, you know, like when you actually go into the module and you look at all these readings and those lists and everything, it may look daunting to anybody, including me. Um, so collaborate sessions are excellent to make sense out of things. But uh, so do on-campus lectures. And the on-campus lectures are longer and they're more thorough than what we're doing here. So I invested my own money in Camtasia, even though university has its own system. So I'm trying to think of ways in which I could actually record um, uh, on-campus lectures and basically maybe even then minimize these meetings and maybe have them, you know, like we have one hour or maybe one hour every two weeks, depending how the students respond. So I don't know what will happen. I'm just trying to do my best. I also, and, and mainly motivated by the fact that we have three hours on campus and here we only have one hour. And I can't see how that works out considering that the students on campus also have access to the modules. And then three hours of me, it's, it seems like they're getting a better deal. Because we're exploring things much more thoroughly than maybe we're doing it here. I don't know. But I think that the amount of time does matter. So what I prepared for today is the following. Um, I might just make us. So this is a little picture of our class, for our class today. But if I were to make sure that everybody understands, um, assignment one that asks you to do the website and all these four or five things. Now, what they actually mean, and I may have explained it many times before, but I will do it again. It, it asks you to do all these things, but not in relation to your beliefs, intuitions, joys, or, miser or miseries, but in relation to the concept of literacy. That's why, right at the beginning, you have a request here to actually define the concept of literacy. And in fact, every other component of your assignment must refer back to your understanding of literacy. So each of the key components of your portfolio, you will describe by continuously drawing on your understanding what literacy is. And that's how academic assignments or academics, academic works um, look like in order to maintain consistency. And also, it's a check. Because if you write something, say, in here, blah, 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 you write, and it says more than what you had in here, because by the time you were writing about reflections, you, have, you learned so much, and now you can write seven pages on it, then you evaluate the skeleton of these seven pages and you add to the concept of literacy and then you check whether you had the same components of literacy addressed in all these other questions. So that's extremely important, right, for systematicity and you learn to be systematic. And when you're teachers, you will be assessing systematicity because last thing you want it's students' works that looks like dog's breakfast, right? Well, now dog's breakfast looks pre look pretty good, but you know what I mean. So you're learning here and testing yourself here to be systematic. Now, once again, for assignment one, what you need is to cover module one, module two, module three. Typically, from my experience in this unit, module one and module two are brief, 
and everybody loves them and everybody has fun with them and module three gets ignored. So what I did this this year and or this semester, I reversed things a little bit and um I'm very happy to work with your questions from assignment one and from assignment two. I mean not from module one and module two, but for the first few collaborates and maybe and, and today definitely I'm not sure about next week. But what we what we are doing is at this very moment looking at the concept of literacy by looking at other people's lesson designs and learning whether if they whether they what they said they did, which is teaching literacy, whether what they said actually aligns with what we think literacy is. Now why am I doing this? Well, it took me only, you know, ten years to get there, or maybe twenty years, I have no idea. But we're doing this for you to learn investigative and critical skills. Right? Because there is no point of you being in school and getting 300 ideas of 3,000 colleagues of yours and then getting all these PD people coming and telling you more ideas until your head explodes. So what you need to do, and you no longer want another PD, right? Unless it's an opportunity to meet your friends and just relax. So that's the value of PD and there's nothing wrong about it. Socialization among professional people is extremely important. So what we will do today is look some more into Kathy Mill's paper and also uh, some other paper. We will think of the concept of literacy and we will begin with the concept of literacy which is what we have learned from last week. So it's a cute thing here. I like my pictures. You know. So features of literacy, Chelsea, you're the only one. For three million students we have in our unit, you seem to be the only one in need of learning. But since you are here, and it seems to be a pattern lately in um, ELA 200, yeah, it's an easy unit until it comes to an assignment, right? <laughs> That's very funny. Anyway, it's life. So um, features of literacy. Um, can you, Chelsea, come up with some features? If you, I mean, I'll give you a bit of time to do that, but if you don't type anything or you have nothing on your mind at this very moment, I might just take a step forward. But if you have some ideas that you might remember from last week or from the modules, that would be great. I mean, no pressure on you. I just don't want to turn it into beating people over their heads with my voice, I wouldn't mind to actually have um, some all right. Do you see any idea um, about any features of literacy? Some things we said last week was it was ability to use multimodal literacy tools to effect a desired impact, right? And we were talking about in module one that both medium and form matter, right? So it's not that you select only form. Oh, I will tell her I hate her, or I will tell her I love her, but you also select the medium in order for someone that you hate to actually get the message really strongly. Now, I'm just making it a joke because it's 5 o'clock in the afternoon or 4 o'clock, but you can see that if you want to send your mother a birthday card or whatever, a birth if you want to send some birthday wishes to your mother, you don't write it on a scrap of paper, right? You chose your medium. And what made you choose a scrap of paper as opposed to a beautiful card? How did you know what to choose? And these are the sort of things that we will return to when we will be learning how to read the curriculum and how to evaluate our own literacy practices. Because um, one of the things I sometimes get from students is, I do this and I choose a beautiful birthday card. Fantastic. What made you do that? You need to know. 
so that when you later on in assignment two design your learning activities, you will know what to do in order for students to know to, right? Because you might have, um, you know, like I, I often repeat it, when you're 30, 27, or 50, you can't remember how it felt when you were five or 18. And for us, it's very clear. They will just do this, and they will do it like this. And we forget all kinds of experiences that we went through painfully and sometimes shamefully when we made mistakes in order to now know what's best to do and what's not to do, right? But you don't want your students. I mean, we are paid in order for our students to actually get some shortcuts, right? That's what training is. It's providing people with shortcuts. Otherwise, we would all have to learn how to breathe. And so an evolution did that, and now our trainers do that. So if we were thinking of multimodal literacy tools, um, which we discussed last week, the examples multimodal. Right, so I'm just making sure that also our students get a bit of grammar lesson. Sometimes I get, so remember the thing like social media? Media is the plural of medium, right? It's from Latin. You wouldn't want to say mediums because it means something completely different. Someone who can tell you uh, your future. So multimedia and multimodal, right? Different media, using different media. That's what multimodal literacy means, using different media. So we were thinking last week, we were talking about posters, right? We were thinking about your humble book, right, which is text. Then we were thinking of brochures, right, brochures. Right, they're a bit different than posters and a bit different than um, uh, a book, flyers, right, the different things, birthday card, the different medium, um, audio media, right, how to actually create, do you have a literacy, literacy skills to actually produce a radio program, it's very important too, so audio devices, Video, let me not forget the video as well. And there are different video, t types of video. So you have documentaries, you have uh, tutorials, you have um, monologues. It's quite plenty of those today online. Uh, and people actually make money out of it. So there are girls, I don't know how old, they put the camera in their kitchen themselves in front of it, and they just talk about how they view the world. And they make, I don't know how much, but they're relatively a lot because some of them get thousands and thousands of viewers. So, um, so people are using video for different purposes, to express their opinions, to actually have their own newsrooms nowadays. People actually are not willing that much to watch television. Well, maybe you are, but uh, increasingly in the world, people turn away from television, and they actually select their own newsrooms online, so which is interesting. So we've got many media that we can uh, draw on in, uh, in order to what? In order to act informed and, and be informed, all that. What else do we have? Desired impact, exactly. So we choose the uh, medium, and we also choose a, a, choose speci a specific form so that we can effect a desired impact. We want my mother, or your mother, or whatever, a mother, to feel appreciated. That's why it's not a scrap of paper, because what? Because in our Western culture, uh, uh, a sort of torn piece of paper means messiness has meanings, right? So we know it, but we're prob not sure how much we knew that when we were four. You know, it's very cute when children take a piece of paper and just write, Mommy, I love you, right? It's really cute and it's appropriate. But when you do that when you are 18 for your mother's wedding day or wedding anniversary or something like this, it kind of looks like you could do better. You know, so there are different expectations in terms of the selections we make uh, from children than they are from adults or older children. So last week, 
last week um, we were talking about exactly this kind of thing. So I'm choosing from our module three um, different types of text. So I click here, right? So this is your module three. I click here. It enables me to go to module three. It's a bit slow because I'm having two systems recording this um, lecture, so uh, things are like this. And I found this paper by Kathy Mills, and we discussed it last week a little bit. And I would like to come back a little bit for a while to that paper. By all means, read it. It's especially if you are in middle school or high school. But I'm, read, I'm, I'm, I'm analyzing this with you because we're talking about literacy. So you can see how slowly it's going. There's a lot of text there um, that I may or may not agree with, but OK. So uh, before I get into this, let, let us agree on some things we said last week. So it's, um, we've, we've discussed multimodal, like, you know, selecting, say, for example, for birthday, for, to, to send birthday wishes, a birthday card. But now these people are creative. They make videos, funny videos, cartoons, all kinds of things, because the media, multimedia enables them to do. But in order to make people laugh, feel appreciated, all of that. So one of the things we said last week, that one of the key criteria of literacy is purpose, right? Without the desire, without the purpose, you have no impact, right? And then depending on the purpose for which you use literacy tools, you will make different selections. That's extremely important. If you can't remember anything else, remember this. And I would let you know that in my personal view and from my personal experience with students, even though we study different texts that talk about pedagogy, you know, um, later texts, uh, I don't know, old texts, whatever we study, they all say that human action is purpose-oriented. But for some inexplicable reason, we say that. And, when we, and then we do what we've always done, which means what? Remove the purpose. And there is a reason for removing purpose, which is to return to the world of objects. If you can't remember how we discussed this world of objects last, year, last week, then please review our little discussion last week when we said that there, there is, uh, that the world can be two things, the world of action and the world of, in, as a place of things. So the objective world is what we can all define. But then there is the subjective world, which is the world of values, those values that prompt us to action, those values that we, um, drawn in order to um, act. And what happens uh, with the purpose in literacy classes um, was been so long, for so long, um, trained to think of the world as a, as a place of things, right? So there's a table, there's a chair, it's, right, or so there's linguistics and there's genre that we're actually making out of our students linguists as opposed to people who actually can use literacy critically. Because you can be the best linguist on the planet, but you actually could be a very bad communicator, right? So one doesn't imply the other. And our job is actually for our students to be literate, not to end up to be linguists, which is a little bit reductionist. But in any event, if you remember that one of the, that the key feature of literacy is purpose, because it's the purpose that, that will enable us to make choices. So that's that. And we will look at it today with Kathy again. And then we also, um, that purpose links obviously to the idea that literacy is a social practice. People say literacy is a social practice, but what does that mean? It's that link we create between the subjective world of value and the intersubjective world of values as well and objects. So it's a social practice because we're not actually using 
literacy tools to um, that we understand only in in terms of our personal world, but we're using them to actually act on other people. So it has this community, if I can just say in this why aspect. And I went actually on the internet and I wanted to have a look what it means. And you know, literally, I wrote literacy as a social practice, and there it was. Literacy is a crucial aspect of people's lives. People's lives. So, well, that, well you know, it's, it's, it's a subjective and intersubjective, which contains the ability to read and write, and the ability for verbal and nonverbal communication. Within the, this content, literacy is a social practice, is an important parameter that contributes to people's effective interactions, right? The things they do. So it's a community sort of, um, you know, the fact that literacy is a social practice, it means it was developed by the community in order to fulfill community purposes. This is extremely important too, and it will be extremely vital for assignment two. Also in assignment one, but in assignment one we will do it in such a way that if you are not careful you will forget for assignment two, right? But in assignment one we will be learning with that, uh, we'll be learning this point. So literacy is not something we do, it's something we do because we are personally moved to do it and we develop the motivation from our interactions with people and, the, and our engagement in, with literacy tools enable us to impact on other people. So I would just, because Chelsea is very quiet, <laughs> um, I've been a lecturer for so long that I don't mind people quiet because you know like, no I don't mean it, it's a joke, I wanted to say you know I, I could talk forever. <laughs> but let us actually look at the model here. So if, if illiteracy purpose is so extremely important because it determines our selections uh, of the medium and also of um, the form, so what happens and also, you know, anyway, audience is implied because probably purpose instantly implies audience, but maybe not always, so we have to think about it too. What I find extremely, extremely interesting that when um, the pedagogues from this multi literacy and uh, um, well, because multi literacy is just a concept, right? It's not a method. Unfortunately, with multi literacy comes also the method, which is called systemic functional linguistics. And I think we've spoken about it before, so I'll just talk about those people as multiliteracy pedagogy, which is only a, a method of kind, right? It's not really uh, about multiliteracy itself, but it's just such a weird way to connect it. So let's call it multiliteracy pedagogy. You would think, or I would think, that if I were to say the, uh, the lessons applied in this particular uh, experiment, the lessons applied the multiliteracy pedagogy, you can see they use it themselves, involving situated practice, you can read what it means, I think that throughout the unit you will learn what it means, but it means just context. Right. Um, overt instructions, which is interesting because what about covert, um, critical framing, whatever, and transformed practice, yeah. So something will change, hopefully. So now when we look at the aim, we can see here that the aim was to enable learners to collaboratively design a clay motion movie. I'm not sure whether we discussed it last week, but one cannot define aim when you set up your lessons in relation, in instrumental forms. I want my students to be able to use comma, big deal. Or I want my students to be able to <coughs> design a brochure. Why? Right, so what needs to happen that if literacy, you, you need to in your design and in your thinking of literacy, what you should do is to actually, when you actually ex explicate what you're doing in your lessons or, or, or in the uses of literacy, you need to explicate the purpose first because it's most critical. So you have your skeleton, your sort of defin definition of literacy which has criteria like uh, purpose, whatever else we had there, 
you need to integrate those in your explanation. What's the purpose of the um, activity? It cannot be to co uh, collaboratively design a clay motion movie. It might be something that actually the researchers say a little bit later. Okay, so let's read. An animation will they explain what it is. And then she says the process occurs. Okay, so she talks a lot about the clay motion movie as if it was the goal. I mean, even if clay motion movie was very important to do, you would think that we will learn it in relation to other tools so that we could compare the reason why clay motion movie is best for a particular purpose. We discussed it last week, and I remember it very clearly. So, <clears throat> going down, 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 then there's a lot of description of what they would be doing, you know, all the technicalities, right, because we are multiliteracy, like multimedia. And, and now look at this. The students were required, we discussed it last week, that's not a very nice way to actually get your students on your side to require them to do, but the fact that the, the community aspect of the lesson plan is basically put at the end of its justification, almost like an afterthought. Oh, yeah, by the way, I forgot, to, I forgot to tell you that, yeah, the kids will be doing this thing because we will make them, which is really, really collaborative, right? Not, right? So um, we will make them do this thing so that they can create a movie for their buddies, which is the five-year-olds or four-year-olds that come to school. So say that they are 10, 11, or 12, their buddies are coming to school, so you associate an older child with a little child. Yeah, we'll do that. So, so they'll be doing this for this purpose, right? So we will tell them. We tell them what movie to use, what, what software to use. We, we, we will tell them uh, what to do with it. And then, by the way, we will also, just to show off, we will also show it to the parent community. Look at how good we are, right? I mean, you can instantly see the, the problem with this particular method, which is the purpose is gone, the student is gone, and what we have is the teacher who owns everything. The teacher even owns the relationship of the, between the child and, and, and the buddies, right? Between the student and the buddies, because we know this is going to be good for you and so on. So there is no actual explanation of what literacy is and how this particular lesson is going to play in order to instill in children the concept of how to be literate, the selections you make, you relate the, per the, the medium with the, with the form and the purpose, right? You write them together, make informed choices. And as we said last week, you can't miss the chance of learning why clay motion movie is opposed to something else. And then we discussed last week also when we looked at the steps of this, and it's, look how fast they go through this. I, I just can't believe it. Um, but that's something we'll cover later on, maybe for module, uh, for module four. But for now, let's have a look. Teacher displays movies from other students. So teacher, again, is holding the lead, right? Um, so we're learning about clay motion movies, not, about, not in relation to our purpose and what else we could use, but we're learning by displaying other children's movies, which means we're just throwing the, the form on us. We just have it, we throw the form of clay motion movie on children with our children actually um, and startling the children with it. So in order now for ch to reduce the stress on children, what, what the teacher thinks, that maybe when they show them different templates, practically that's what they are, then maybe the kids will say, oh, okay, if I do this and this. And I mean, this, this could be the, you know, what they call, these people call maybe the hidden curriculum. I have problems with all these things because I think that uh, conspiracy theories, um, you know, may apply or may not apply, I think we need some questions that we need to actually apply to ourselves in order to have a critical perspective on what we do. And here, we, in the only way that the teacher can make the, the choice of clay motion movie um, sort of closer or more meaningful to children is by showing them templates. Oh, look at this, how I, what other children did. And that's what I get later on at university when my students come to me and say, 
can you show me some other examples of students' work for your unit? And I, my thought is like, okay, I can, but who wrote them then? But if they could, you can't. I mean, who was the first one? So, but that's where how this whole thing, you know, propagates through the system. So, uh, and one more point on this one before we move to the next text. Um, Notice, notice, please, that because we don't have a purpose driving the whole thing, this is about the bodies. Well, who are the bodies? Well, tell me more about bodies. What do the bodies understand? What kind of media they actually uh, work with? What do these media do? What form do they use? In the, I mean, we know nothing about the audience. And what, when you look into the curriculum, one thing, it, it says in relation to literacy, you've got to know your audience. But we're not learning about the audience and the kind of media they use and the kind of languages used in the media. We're learning everything but clay motion movie. And this is why I was correct when Kathy Mills is saying right at the end of, her, of the explanation of the aim of the lesson plans, right there is an afterthought. Oh, by the way, they're going to do it for children, for other little children. It's an afterthought. It's not the driving aim of the unit. And that's why it doesn't drive the teaching. What's the purpose? Who's the audience? What do the audience use? What do they know? How do they speak? What are their favorite things? I mean, if you learn that, because when you're 10 and 12, you might not actually remember what the kids use and their favorite phrases. Wouldn't it be nice to use some of those funny phrases in the thing so that they can relate their own text to our clay motion movie? Yes, but this is not the purpose of the teacher. The teacher has her own agenda and is driving and disregarding the audience and disregarding what the students in the class know about the audience, the little buddies. We've got technology that drives this one, not the information about the audience and our relationship. And Instead of using media as a help to further our relationship with other people, we have the medium as the goal. It can't be. So, uh, Chelsea, unless you have some other questions, unless you have some other questions, I might just move on to the next reading. Um, yeah, so, yeah, you can see it, right? So, w when someone actually and, and you can actually work it out, all that I'm saying, from principle one, what is literacy? You don't actually have to be a specialist in literacy to see it. Just lesson one in literacy, 101. What's literacy? Where is literacy here? Okay, so I will just go to another reading that you have there. This is the reading that even though I um, included five billion of readings in module three, this particular reading is always used by students in ELA 200. And it is a nice reading. I collaborated a little bit with the author, Maureen Ockerman, and I always say it proudly, not because she's Mary Ockerman or because I like her writing, but because she's from Stanford. So, was, <laughs> so I also like having a little bit of um, accolade on my back. But um, as a result, Maureen sent me uh, Marin sent me a lot of, of her papers, and I was paid twenty-five thousand dollars for a project to actually think, and consequently, I analyzed those papers, and also from the perspective of what's literacy. Now, people like Nasai and Wells here and so on. I mean, for you, they knew names. But for me, the people who were writing PhDs at the same time as I was writing, so, and we were corresponding together, dare I say, and never agreeing on a single point. But it's not, well, not never agreeing, agree, not agreeing on a lot of points, but agreeing on some points. So if we look at this table, this is a sweet table, and I think it has um, a lot to offer to our ELA 200 students. But again, when you hold this concept of literacy, you know, the principles you have outlined, the community purpose, it has a purpose, it's community oriented, and what else did we say, um, just to remind us, right, it's community oriented, um, 
medium mailers and form mailers, right? Because these are all um, object of our selections. So you've got, you write it on your little paper next to you, and then you read this. And it's a nice table, I think, except it has a little problem there, and a special one that uh, is, and sorry for the text being a little bit blurry, um, that's how it looks. I think, yeah, anyway, so on the, on the top we have uh, what she compares, what happens to children when they speak, listen, and read, when the teacher is in control, and when students uh, can be sources of information. Now, instantly, for me, when I look at um, these two columns, when the teacher is source of information, great. When the students are sources of uh, information, great. But what's missing? Chelsea, do you know what's missing? If literacy is, is part of community, and they are tools developed by the community for community purpose, then a lot of knowledge about literacy, how to use literacy, and how to make choices cannot come from a five-year-old who is sitting next to me. And if we don't want the teacher to be all knower, and the teacher is not, a lot of times in your curriculum and in your, in your in, in traditional, well, people say it's not tradition, but it is traditional, when you are told to model text reading, what well, is fantastic, but you are not an actor, and you can't be all things and say teachers modeling things, it's fantastic. Maybe, I can't think of a country now, because you know, I'm, I have friends in Cambodia, which is relatively poor, and yet everybody runs with a mobile phone there. So I just can't think, and I don't want to say Bangladesh, because you know, for me, I don't know anything about the country, but if you are in the country, say, where there are no resources, maybe that's all you have is the sort of knowing teacher and relatively knowing students, but we have an entire community, we have entire, richness of resources online where we can find out how actors model a text, how children read text to themselves and to others, right? We can look at different types of ways in which in, in context people read and use literacy. We don't have to make the teacher just lose their throat. So what I'm saying is when we have two columns in regard to what, where are the resources, right, where the information sits, to say that there's only two of them, it's literally playing into hands of, remember the guy Ken Robinson? He's not the only one saying that, but if you actually look at any video of Ken Robinson, pretty much in every video he says, the school is a jail. If not a factory, then a jail, right? So you've got like these miserable people locked up in that little room with yellow walls, and nowadays it's just more nice, nicer walls, right? But still, and they only have each other. There's this beautiful uh, guy, John Ralston Soul. He's a philosopher and historian in Canada, and he wrote this book, and he says, well, what, will, what do you think will be the, an outcome of the discussion between Ten geographers who think that the earth is flat. You, you put them all in the room and they all discuss how flat it is, right? So you need to have community as a source of information. And for assignment two, we will be thinking, and also for assignment one, we will be thinking how we draw on community in order to use literacy as a social tool, not as your own personal idiosyncratic tool. If it is your own personal idiosyncratic, most of the time you would end up in some sort of institution because being you know, idiosyncratic shows that you cannot interact with people. So we need here someone else than just a teacher and student. We need resources. And obviously this has an impact now this particular table and this thinking where you remove the community from your concept of literacy, once again, it will have an impact on the way you design a literacy activity because its purpose will not be oriented towards giving to the community, contributing, impacting on the community. It will be about each other. I write for you, you write for me, and the teacher will mark it. Like, when, when 
do we do something like this in real life? The kinds of literacies that those children are likely to learn through this context are idiosyncratic. Uh, I don't have enough words in English to be critical enough about this, but basically they're limited and they will be particular to the culture of the classroom, but not the cultures that are out there and that we need to be exposed to and expose our students to for them to be literate. Right, so look what happens then in practice in the class. Oh, I should have used my own um, text because this is really unclear. Um, okay, let's have a look whether it's in this paper, whether this paper will show up. Because this text, it's really invisible, right? So we need something that we can actually read as opposed to guess what's on the screen. And I wrote the paper using this uh, model by Ockerman and we might find it there. So I wrote the paper about building students or building theories, right? Because a lot of education research is actually oriented towards building theories, yet let's build yet another theory. Right, that's great. What's happening to students? Where is the student in your theory? I theorize the student. Well, that's fantastic. So where is the student? You know, the one that is the real one? Uh, so I think that we need to um, be a little bit careful. Okay, so, but in terms of their learning, oh, I just want to move it down a little bit and, okay. So I hope everyone can see this. Okay, so uh, Chelsea, here it goes. There is a situation. In this particular school, there was a bunch of students who had difficulties with reading. Like, so it wasn't your average Susie and Kathy and all of that. These are kids who can't read. There's a problem happening there. Now, this is very interesting. So um, what do you do? You would think that in order to do something, you, what would you do? I mean, I don't know what you would do, but this is what I would say. First of all, I would make a friend with the university. You know, there's 3,000 scholars at every university in literacy, and all you have to do is send them email and make friends with them, you know, you, you, your teacher from the undergraduate unit or someone else when you are in Adelaide, you befriend them and so on, and you, you kind of look for assistance, right? You, or it's, it's really a difficult situation where the teacher um, is required to now solve problems that no academic in the university can solve, right? So these are issues. Anyway, to cut the long story short, we've got 15 minutes. So this particular class that was observed by the lecturer and I don't, by the academic, and I don't understand why it was just observed. And, and by the way, probably was also informed by this academic because Marin loves this class. She talks very positively about it, okay? So we will look at it from the perspective of literacy. So what um, happened? They gathered all these three, four children, five children, I can't remember how many children, they gathered them in the room, as they do. They, they gave them a book to read. Like they can't read, they gave them a book to read. And they told them to read it. That's fantastic. So I can't jump, so you make me jump all day. It's great. Until I break my leg or something, I don't know. Well, anyway. How, how consistent is that activity with the concept of literacy? I mean, reading is not reading. It's part of literacy, of literate behavior. So in order to assist people with reading, you should actually comply with your, uh, make your activity comply with the principle of literacy, which is, say, purpose. Why the heck are they reading this particular book? Do they know that? I mean, I don't know it by reading this uh, article. Beats me why they read it. They read it because the teacher fronted up with a book. I mean, how literate it is to me just looks like I have no idea what to do with you guys. Here's the book. Do, read it. And they go, all right. If they're little, they will say, yeah, we will. We love you a lot. But when they're big, they will say, why? All right? So anyway, so they have to read this book even though they can't read. And here's the teacher. Notice this little comment, you know, helpful comment by Mary 
Barron writing in now saying this is all very cool methodology because the teacher doesn't talk. Well, the teacher doesn't have to talk. You can straight jacket people just by looking at them, right? You don't have to react or talk or whatever. Simply setting up this whole context in a, in a way that is not compliant with the concept of literacy as from people to people. That's what literacy is. From people we learn, to people we give. There are no people here. There's no community here. There's just a book. So basically here, they read this text. So Adam is reading this text. And after a while, Adam has a problem with one word. So he's trying to hypothesize what the heck does that mean and comes up with most spectacular questions and responses to them, which clearly show that there is something jarring in the way Adam relates to text. Now, we will never know what it is, because we are not mind readers. Your teacher is not a mind reader, and the Thomas who tries to help Adam is not a mind reader. Well, so what do you do? Look, it's not it's assignment two question, but for assignment one, you don't do that. Because if literacy is a, com is a is being literate is a social activity, then maybe if Adam approached the whole activity a little bit different and was able to break it down into pieces, pieces and therefore break down his understandings of the way in which he related to the activity, maybe this wouldn't have happened, or maybe the problem would have been more precise, but clearly Adam is reading, and we don't know how many problems he had before it fell out of his mouth saying something about the donkey and the beast, right? Like, uh, why would he even worry about the idea that they don't ride the donkey, but they just lead the beast? Right, why would it, I mean, but indeed, the children, they're trying to sort out how the world works, right? So, we don't know where the question came from, we don't know what caused it, we don't know where to relate it. The teacher didn't respond, but the teacher thinks that Thomas will do a better job. You know, sometimes people say that children understand children better than adults. Well, that could be. I am not saying to um, remove children's interactions with one another from classroom, but what I am saying is whatever you do, make it actually align with the concept of literacy so that when children discuss and when they actually explore a community, all the pieces are in place, not just one of them. It's like looking with half an eye at the world and saying you see everything. Well, anyway, Thomas comes up with an explanation. Adam has no idea what he said, so we just moved on. Right. If you look at the brain, what's happening in the brain, you've got the right hemisphere, you've got the left hemisphere. The right hemisphere is the very unhappy hemisphere. It turns itself on when you don't understand things. Now, imagine Adam already is in a class which is difficult, right? They have difficulties in reading. Now, he's, in, he's put in a situation where exactly he has difficulty because he can't relate the activity to himself and all things that are happening to his own world. So he's already, so there is this pressure on Adam. He's feeling, he's feeling it. His right hemisphere is starting to detect problems. First of all, he has to read. Second of all, there's this donkey and the beast, and he can't put them together. Then Thomas said something. He still doesn't understand. He moves on, but the right hemisphere is active, which means the pressure intensifies. Now, never mind, in another class, Adam will go, and there will be, teaching them about well-being. That's wonderful. I, I like those morality classes and values classes. They're great. But in the literacy classroom, you also have to think about well-being. Where is Adam's well-being well considered? When this is not the literacy class, and Adam is not dividing or spacing his own learning according to the problems he has with relating what he does to the community, he is just basically told to swim. And he can't. So what, there was this another exchange between Adam and Thomas, and then some time passes. Well, I wonder how Adam felt when that time was passing. 
Did he switch now back to the left hemisphere, which is happy because it has all the answers? Or is he still sitting in the right hemisphere and getting cancer? I want to know how Adam is feeling. What's now active? You can see that when we violate concepts of literacy, it is not just a little mistake. And it is not that children will catch up one day when they're 18. There is a pressure. There are real things happening to children. And then they don't come to school. And then we wonder. And then we give them names. So this one is lazy. And I'm not saying that some are not. I'm not saying that there are no children who literally, no matter what you do, you could stand on your head and invite the whole world, and they will be still ignoring you. Yeah, but what I am saying is at least be, you'll be okay with what you do. And to do that, for you to be okay with what you do, you actually have to understand. And to understand, you have to relate it, what you do, to some principles. That's why the concept of literacy is so important, because if you don't understand what's literacy, then what you're doing in the classroom is just a big game, right, for you for you. But for them, it's how they feel. It's how they feel about themselves. There is research done with in, um, uh, what is called fruit fly. Fruit flies fight. Who would think that even a stupid fruit fly would fly, uh, would fight? But they do. But the research shows, and I had it, you used to have it on my um, in uh, ELA 200 resources. I'm not sure it's now there. Sometimes I remove things because I don't want you to be more saturated than you are. But basically what they were showing that once the fruit fly loses a fight, the fruit fly is unwilling to fight because of the, whatever these hormones are called, oxytocin and whatever, they're not firing anymore. The, the sense of self is diminishing. And maybe you can convince the fruit fly to fight again, but if it loses, and here Adam is losing at least twice, at least. I mean, the whole interaction shows that Adam never actually put it together. The fruit fly lower, the, the, lowers its self-esteem. The, the interaction, the, the fight, lowers the self-esteem of a fruit fly, and it never wants to fight. It becomes, um, what do you call it? Um, less involved, less engaged. It's kind of like, uh, I used to have those words when I was doing this particular research. Um, basically, the, the status of the fruit fly among the community, at least in that fruit fly's mindset, is so low that it feels like dying without fighting, right? So that's what happens when the things we do in classroom are very real. And what I love about the Simon one, whoever worded it before me, was an Aboriginal teacher we had in our uh, college. I love this assignment because it puts in front of our eyes the concept of literacy and asks us to take it more seriously so that we actually can reflect on what we do in order to do the job well. So Chelsea, I'm done for today. That will do. We've covered a little bit more in class. So uh, that's interesting, but more or less the same, except that I spoke about things a bit longer and maybe in a greater detail. I think we also covered capabilities, you know, the general capabilities and the curriculum, how to work with general capabilities and with the, uh, you know, so we were talking about the different dimensions of the curriculum and how they relate to each other. But I guess um, for now we will leave it and, um, Next week, we will start bringing those aspects closer because we need to learn how all of this now that we learned so far can help us with evaluating our own literacy activity, one activity. Not, I don't need a list, I do this, I do this, I do this, because I'm, I don't care. <laughs> I just would like to see whether we can pick one and, we can, and whether we can use the curriculum or earliest learning framework and think of what we're doing Critically, the more critical we are, the more we can evidence how much is involved to do these things, how much knowledge we bring in to do these things well, and how much maybe we don't bring in and could have if it was maybe more formal, but in our home, it doesn't matter. But if it was more formal, more things we would bring in. 
and how we evaluate our literacy activity will then impact on how we will be planning it for assignment, planning a learning activity for assignment two. So it was a little bit fast, but I have only one hour, and um, I just wanted to cover these little things because I think they're important. Okay, just <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, so thank you. And uh, thank you for coming here you know, and holding the candle for everybody else. And I'll see you and whoever else on next Thursday. I'll see you next Thursday.